Oops. So with everything that Sonia just described, coming together into these fridges, we'll have the capacity to measure and control a lot more qubits. And so we have plans to really take advantage of this. I said that we're going to be making lots of these Aspen scale chips in the coming months. Now we're gonna have the capability to cool down lots of these Aspen scale chips. And so we'll even be able to do things like put multiple chips into a fridge at the same time, which is not very typical in this field. Now obviously that's great because it means more people will be able to use more chips We'll be able to have more people simultaneously operating them. But it also opens the door for a new kind of way of thinking about our QPUs. In particular, in the classical computing world, the multi-core approach has gained a whole lot of, uh, of use over the last 10 or 15 years. As it's been made harder and harder to make individual CPUs you know, perform better, nowadays when you go buy a computer, mo the processor typically has multiple processors on a chip that run in parallel. We think that now's the time to start talking about that for quantum processors. And in particular, even if chips are in different fridges, you might be able to run QPUs in parallel running the same algorithm. We have a, a really early sort of alpha version of this multi-core capability actually available now that, um, that some of our partners have used. And I'd like to invite one of them uh, up onto the stage to talk about what this multi-core approach might be able to do for you. So um, I'd like to, to call up Nathan from Xanadu to come uh, talk about that. Hi everyone, it's my pleasure to be here today and to speak to you at this event. So I'd like to take you on a, a bit of a speculative journey about what it means to have the ability to have multiple processors working, working together for a larger computation. So I'll just start with some basic motivation. So at the fundamental level, computation is compositional. You have small subcomponents that you want to iterate, you want to connect together, you want to figure out how everything connects and flows through the larger computation. Okay, so that's the basic framework. And then we can imagine that each step in one of these uh, larger computations can be either a classical or a quantum computer. And what we should do is we should let the classical computer specialize in the things that it's already proven that it's very good at, and we should let the quantum computers focus on the subtasks that they are inherently good at. And in particular, quantum computers should specialize at evaluating certain kinds of functions more efficiently than classical computers. As well, you might have multiple quantum processors used together in a larger computation. For instance, you might have um, two different QPUs that are physically different, and they're needed to be two different stages of a larger computation. Finally, as, as Andrew mentioned, uh, we can learn a lesson from classical computing where at some point there was a limit in scaling the capabilities of a single chip and the industry moved towards a multi-core architecture where you got increasing performance gains by coupling together many, many cores. And in fact, the GPU is maybe an extreme example of this. A GPU, I think, has thousands of specialized cores on a single chip or a single board. Okay, so that's the basic motivation. Now, what are the ingredients that we'll need in order to facilitate using multiple devices together? Um, maybe I'll start with something that's um, Surprising, I think the, the key ingredient, the key perspective is this notion of differentiable programming. When we started thinking at, at Xanadu about how to do hybrid computations, so to put together uh, classical and quantum resources or to put together multiple quantum resources, uh, we fell back to something from deep learning. So deep learning is a, a field of machine learning where you basically program what your computation can do and then you later optimize that. And you need to be able to optimize every step in that computation which means every step should be differentiable. Uh, it just so happens that quantum computers are differentiable if you look at them in the right way. And this perspective allows us to very flexibly make plug and play pretty flexible hybrid or multi-QPU architectures. Uh, as well, you're gonna need software that makes all of this possible. That was uh, what we started building about two years ago at Xanadu. We have software called Penny Lane. And you can think of it as a a general purpose quantum computing software with a heavy, heavy focus on this differentiable programming aspect. So it has um, automatic differentiation, so the optimization is basically transparent to the user. It has very seamless integration with classical machine learning tools, uh, and as well it has very seamless integration with quantum computing tools. So you can take uh, something uh, from TensorFlow, a classical machine learning library, and very easily connect it to uh, run on a QPU from Rigetti, for instance. We've had a 
uh, a co-developed a forest plug for Penny Lane over the last two years with Rigetti. Okay, so that's the software. And then you also need the availability. So someone has to build these devices and make them available to you. And they have to make them available in a way that is useful. So it's, it's really not useful to have all these things sitting behind a queue. Especially in machine learning and optimization, you have many, many queries you need to make. You need to update lots. And so you need to have the ability to have basically real-time access. And you need to have the ability for your devices to communicate to each other very quickly. That can be between the CPUs and the QPUs, but also maybe the QPUs need to communicate to each other very quickly. So having everything all in, in one house and very low latency is key if you want to use multiple devices together. Okay, so that's, that's the basic motivation. That's the basic ingredients. Now, what does it actually look like to use multiple QPUs together? So before I get into that, I want to kind of take a step back and just uh, set, the, set the ground rule. So build a basic intuition of what a quantum circuit does and how it fits into a larger computation. And then we can start composing this basic unit. So we think of a, a quantum circuit with this basic, basic abstraction called a quantum node. And the idea here is a quantum circuit has three main steps. You have some state preparation, which may depend on some input data. You have some unitary transformation, which may have some free parameters. And then you have some final measurement. And you can execute all of that on a quantum computer, but you can also just draw a box around it. And you can say, this is just a function evaluator. This is something that takes in classical information. It has classical parameters, and it gives out classical information from the measurements. So a classical computer can work with that. Right? So I, I've, I've drawn this, um, this box here, this function f. It's just a classical function. It happens to be implemented on a quantum computer, but it's, it's a function that processes classical information. And it's callable by the classical computer. And this basic unit then allows us to start composing and putting things together. Okay, so when you're starting to compose, the very first natural step, I said computation is inherently kind of an iterative process, so you might want to do something sequentially. You might want to take one unit, do some computation, take that output of that, feed it as the input of another step. And those steps individually could be these quantum nodes, these quantum circuits that are executing. Okay, what is the use for something like this? I think it's actually uh, probably an open question, probably at the forefront of research. Maybe some early ideas that you could have. Um, you can imagine some of the nodes are classical, some of them are quantum, and you want to pre- and post-process data that's coming in and out of your quantum computer with a classical model. Or you can start thinking about maybe machine learning and neural networks. They're a very natural uh, kind of sequential model where you have many layers, and you can replace each of the layers with a quantum circuit. Something that's kind of uh, the opposite of a sequential computation is parallel computation. And this is where I think in the near term there's lots of uh, low-hanging fruit. So parallel computation is very natural in classical scientific computing. You have large problems, you break them down into a bunch of smaller components, and then you can basically run those components independently of each other at the same time with very little need to communicate between those sub-computations. And then maybe at the, end, at the end, you aggregate that information together to get some final answer. So here's where I think there's actually uh, many opportunities available to us, even in the near term, even on today's devices, uh, for leveraging multiple QPUs together. So I have this table here, which has some, some ideas that we've kind of seeded. Uh, by no means is this exhaustive, but I'll quickly go through some of these, these basic ideas and how you can leverage multiple QPUs. So the first one is pooling measurement results. Say you have a circuit, you want to compute some expectation values. If I have two QPUs, I can run that same circuit twice. Sorry, run, run that same circuit on both of them at the same time, and I'll get more shots in the same amount of time, which means I can get more precise, more accurate exp exp expectation values at the quicker pace. Something that's maybe similar is in an optimization algorithm. You want to find not expectation values, but candidate solutions to your problem. And if I run the same optimization algorithm on two QPUs at the same time, I'll be finding better candidate solutions quicker because I just have more resources devoted to the task. In machine learning, it's very important to pump lots of data into a computation. So in an obvious way, having multiple QPUs allows you to pump much more data through a quantum computer circuit per unit time. Uh, so this is, this is really important if you want to do machine learning. This is kind of a big bottleneck that our users of Penny Lane are always asking us about because they can only put in kind of one data point at a time. Also in machine learning, we have the notion of 
gradient computation, so you want to optimize your quantum circuit, and this is relies on gradients. And a gradient is a vector of derivatives. And so for every free parameter in your circuit, you have to compute a derivative. And this can add up if you have lots of free parameters in your circuit. And the gradient computation is just one step, which then you want to iterate many, many times in a variational algorithm. So this could be a big bottleneck as well. Again, you can use multiple QPUs to compute those partial derivatives in parallel and get a, a nice speed up. The final example here, this one is something that maybe you would use in a VQE, a variational quantum eigenstolver example. Uh, you have a large observable. Your computation requires to compute the expectation value of a large observable, but it can be broken down into a number of smaller terms. Uh, how we would do this normally is we would just execute each term and compute those expectation values and then stitch them together afterwards. If you do that in parallel, you can split that work amongst multiple nodes. You can run many different expectation values on different devices and get the answer much quicker. So I'll have an example about that in a moment. Uh, so I started with sequential computation. I then went into parallel computation. The next natural step is this notion of computational graphs. This is again inherited from say a deep learning perspective where you don't really force any particular structure except that you have to connect inputs to outputs and these things can uh, be arbitrarily structured. So being able to run a computational graph or to declare an arbitrary computational graph is what allows you to make very flexible uh, complex hybrid model. So this is a sp specific example where a VQE computation is split over two QPUs and then the results are aggregated classically. So you can start stitching these things very much arbitrarily together. Okay, so now I, I promised some, some demos of some of these uh, examples. So the first demo has to do with variational quantum eigensolver algorithm. The idea here is I have parallel QPUs and I'm gonna use them to speed up the calculation of energy of hydrogen molecule in this case. So I have 14 terms that I need to compute and then I need to aggregate them together at the end. Uh, so what, uh, thanks to Rigetti, we were able to actually reserve and run this computation at, on two QPUs at the same time, Aspen 4 and Aspen 7, and we gave each of them half of the job. So each of them got seven of the 14 terms. And you expect a nice linear speed up here. The more QPUs you throw at it, the faster you can get those answers back because you're dividing the labor. Okay, so this is actually a video of this process. This is a race uh, between the parallel method that we've implemented versus what we would have done before, which is purely sequential. And you can see that the parallel is actually already done and the sequential is uh, going about three times slower. So the three times twice because I'm using two QPUs and there's actually some extra compilation intelligence in the latest version of Penny Lane that we use to get that one extra factor here. Uh, so just as a user, this is tremendously valuable to be able to get that response very quickly back to iterate a lot quicker than you would have before. And it's all made possible by being able to use multiple QPUs at the same time to basically carry the same load together. Another cool example, this is more related to machine learning. So the goal here is we have some simple data sets. Uh, in this case, it's classifying from this iris data set. And you might use a quantum circuit as a machine learning model to classify which, which, uh, which class your data point lies in. And there's this cool notion from machine learning that you can always ensemble models. So you can always take two different models and combine them together. And you should do it better than if you had the individual models separately. Uh, you basically take the, the most confident prediction from the two models. And this is really cool because it allows you to get enhanced performance on your machine learning algorithms when you're not able to just add more qubits, you're not able to make more circuit depth. You can just purely use multi-core architecture and you should, you should see some performance gain in the predictive power of your model by ensembling. So an actual example of that, we, we did a simple model in this IRIS data set and you can see that there's some performance that you get from the ensemble model and then the individual models themselves do much poorer individually. And the reason for that is actually because they know that they're working together they learn to specialize. So one of them carries one part of the load and the other one learns to carry the other part of the load. So Aspen 4 in this particular case learned to specialize in predicting class one and Aspen 7 learned to specialize in predicting classes zero and two. So ensembling is a trick that always allows you to get an expected gain. This is how you win Kaggle competitions is you should have an ensemble of uh, many, many models together. So that's another uh, very easy, quick use case that you can get out of parallelizing QPUs together. Uh, that's the end of my talk. I just have one final slide which summarizes, uh, again, uh, you can speed up today on today's devices, the real world execution time of your algorithms. Um, and then forward looking, 
uh, using multiple QPUs together, where does that lead us to? Well, one thing uh, I, I think a lot about is how to use quantum computations as part of a larger deep learning or differentiable programming model. Uh, I think it's a very natural way to think about things. And then the name of this conference is Advantage, and so maybe it's actually possible to speculate that using multiple QPUs might help us achieve quantum advantage. Maybe if one device is just on the edge of achieving advantage, we can get n of those same devices and they can push back past that barrier. So with that, I'm, I'm finished. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Nathan.